Well, it's good to be able to uh, be back to uh, look at the scriptures, and we're going to be turning to Mark chapter 14 shortly, but we'll just begin with a word of prayer. Our God, we're so grateful that you have spoken to us through your word, and we pray that as we once again consider the person of the Lord Jesus, as recorded by Mark in his gospel, we pray that you would show our hearts to ourselves, that you would help us to understand uh, where we are in relationship with thee, and what we need to change, and what needs to be different. Uh, we give thanks for the record of the Lord Jesus which you have left to us, and we pray that our hearts might be stirred as we consider something more of him today. And so bless your word to us, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Mark chapter 14, we're just going to look at the first 42 verses today. Uh, it's about 72 verses long. Uh, so uh, I was beginning to think that that would be rather a lot for one go. Um, and then I looked at the plan that we had uh, done as a schedule, and I noticed that uh, we had only done uh, 1 to 42 uh, on this section anyway. So I thought um, that was uh, helpful. So uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 1. 3 to 42. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, the master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and to say unto him, one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? And he answered and said unto them, it is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the ditch. The Son of man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of man is betrayed. Good were it for that man, if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it, and gave to them and said, take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But 
After that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And we know that God always blesses his word when we read it uh, together. So we're entering into a section in Mark's Gospel where we are looking at what is described as the passion of the Lord Jesus. And the title we put over this section uh, when we did our outline at the beginning was The Servant's Passion and uh, Death. If we were to go across to Luke's Gospel in chapter 2, uh, a man called Simeon spoke to Mary and Joseph, and he said these words to them. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Here's the bit I want to just note. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The Lord Jesus has been working publicly for about three years. He's been teaching and he's been doing mighty miracles. And he's demonstrated in numerous ways that we've noted throughout this gospel that he is the son of God and that he is the Messiah that Israel was waiting for. And we've seen little inklings of the responses that different people have had towards him. And in the chapter uh, that we had uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had various people coming to Jesus and seeking to trip him up and to question him in order to get him to say something that was wrong. But now when we come to this chapter, and especially these 42 verses, we now have the hearts of men revealed in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is really coming out into the open at this uh, crescendo, as it were, this climax of the life of the Lord Jesus down here. How are men responding to the Lord Jesus? And I use the word man in the sense of mankind, because, of course, we have a lovely incident of a woman in this chapter, uh, do we not? And so I want to uh, really just take this section as a challenge, as we look at the way that different people have their hearts revealed in terms of how they view and respond to the Lord Jesus, and to challenge our hearts as to how we are responding to him as well. 
So in verses 1 and 2, we have the heart of the religious leaders revealed. The heart of the religious leaders revealed. It's a right combination of things, isn't it? A right combination of things. And notice, first of all, the time is two days before the feast of the Passover uh, and uh, the feast of unleavened bread. This should have been a time when they were preparing to remember all that God had done in the past. This is a time when they should be preparing to be set apart for God. This was to be a holy day, a holiday in the true sense of the word. And yet I want you to notice the heart of these men. It says the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft, put him to death. But they said not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. Their hearts were full of deception. They wanted to take Jesus by craft. They knew that they were wrong. And therefore, they would not step out into the open and accuse Jesus openly and publicly. But they sought to take him by crime. Deception filled their heart. But murder filled their heart as well. What did it say? It said, and put him to death. These religious leaders, who no doubt had quoted and taught the Ten Commandments time after time after time. And they would have known that it would have said, thou shalt not murder. And here they were, seeking by some crafty way, some deceitful way, to find an excuse and a reason by which they could put him to death. But notice their hearts were filled with fear as well. They were filled with fear of the ordinary people. They said, we better not do this on the feast day when there's lots of people filling Jerusalem. Let's, let, let's figure out a way of being able to do it quietly and behind closed doors. And when there's not too many people here, their hearts are filled with fear. So often the case is, isn't it, that when we know what we're doing is wrong, we seek to do it behind closed doors. We seek to do it in a roundabout way rather than out in the full broad daylight. I was reminded of John chapter 1, verse 11, which says this, that the Lord Jesus, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And here in picture, with the religious leaders, the leaders of the Jewish people, and here they are with hearts full of deception and hearts full of murder, seeking to do away with the Lord Jesus. Galatians chapter 5 reminds us that some of the works of the flesh, some of the works of those that do not have the spirit of God indwelling them, are envy, hatred, and murder. And here were men, and the very evidence of their behavior demonstrated that the spirit of God was not with them. You know, they had their plans, didn't they? They said not on the feast day. But God throughout the Old Testament had instituted this Passover feast. And the reason that the Passover feast had been instituted was to remember what happened in Egypt. But also to point forward to God's final Passover lamb. And God would not be detracted from his timetable when the final Passover lamb would be offered on the Passover day. Men often have their plans, but they cannot uh, intervene. They cannot change the plans of God. If we were to come down to verses 10 and 11, oh, we have the heart of Judas revealed. And so we begin the chapter with a dark, dark scene. And we're going to move on to another heart that is dark. But the writer sets against that black background, almost a diamond. You know, diamond stands out most against a black or a dark background. And the writer brings before us the beauty 
of another heart in verses two, uh, verses three, three to nine. In verses three through to nine, we have the heart of Mary of Bethany. Her name is not mentioned in this chapter, but if we were to go across John chapter 12, uh, we're told then that the lady mentioned here is Mary of Bethany. What was her heart like? Not a heart full of deception and murder and fear. No, so, so different. Here is a heart that is full of worship. A heart full of worship. You know what the difference was? The religious leaders, they had spent all their time feeling threatened by the Lord Jesus and not really listening to, to what he is saying and not really watching what he was doing. What is the great contrast? Where do we see and read Mary of Bethany? We see her at the feet of Jesus, seeking to learn. And here is the response of the one who's been at the feet of Jesus. It is a heart that is full of worship. How does she demonstrate it? She brings an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. She breaks the box and she pours it on his head. Here's a woman who is not going to hold anything back. You know, it's lovely, uh, uh, two or three chapters back, uh, we had the account of the widow woman, didn't we? The widow woman in the temple. And she came into the temple, and there was all the religious leaders and all the rich people, and they were putting lots in, but they still had plenty. But what does the widow woman do? She gives everything that she had. And here is Mary. Uh, and it's not case that uh, she, uh, she pours a bit from the bottle. She breaks the bottle in order that the whole might be poured out upon the Lord Jesus. You know, it's interesting to notice uh, as we go through this last week of the life of the Lord Jesus, how much more consistent the women are in their devotion and in their service to their master than the men are. And it's lovely uh, that in a society uh, that the Bible was written, uh, where the women were not perhaps treated as they were, should have been on an equal level. That scripture takes time and effort to mention these lovely women and their response and their heart of worship and devotion to the Lord Jesus. But notice it was not just a heart of worship, but it was a heart of understanding as well. A heart of understanding. The people were indignant uh, at what uh, she had done. But notice what the Lord Jesus has, uh, what the Lord Jesus says in verse number eight. It says, she has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burial. All that time sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus was bearing fruition, not just in a heart of devotion, but also in a heart of understanding. The Lord Jesus had told his disciples numerous times that he was going to die, but rise again on the third day. But it seems that this lady was the only one that had listened. And therefore, she knew that there would not be time to properly anoint the body of the Lord Jesus. And in a sense, there wouldn't be any point because the body wouldn't be dead for long enough. And so this lovely lady, she comes and anoints the body before he dies so that it is ready for when he is buried. The time that she had spent with the Lord Jesus led to a heart of worship and of understanding. I suppose the challenge would be how much time we're spending with Christ. And that will be seen in how devoted and worshipful our hearts will be and how much our understanding is increasing and deepening day by day. It's sad to notice, isn't it, the response to Mary? Oh, but this is the same kind of response that those who are full of devotion to the Lord Jesus will receive even today. And notice that they are filled with indignation and they describe what she had done as a waste. 
and that they put a value on uh, the, the price of the ointment of 300 pence, getting on for a year's worth of wages. And effectively, they say, you've wasted a year's worth of your life upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, doesn't the world still do that today? As God's people seek to put their effort into the things of God, and the world would look on and shake their head and say, why do you bother? What is the point? What are you getting out of it for time? Because they do not understand the different perspective that the believer has that we're putting, we're building up treasure in heaven. We've got an eternal perspective. They were filled with indignation. Don't be surprised if you want to devote your life to the Lord Jesus, that the world looks at it and says it's a waste. But they had a complete lack of appreciation of what she had done. But notice the response of the Lord. The response of the Lord. She de he defended the woman. He defended the woman. He said, let her alone. You know, it's lovely, isn't it, that the, the woman doesn't try and defend herself. Her, her point was to worship Christ and to give him the best that she had. And she's going to leave it up to the judge of all men to come to her defense. You know, that's a good, um, a, a good lesson, a good example to follow, isn't it? That as others will perhaps look down upon what we seek to do for Christ, we can leave it with him. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows that we desire to give him uh, the glory. He knows that we bring, seek to bring a heart of devotion to him. And he appreciates it. And he valued what this woman did. He affirmed, not only did he defend her, but he affirmed the value of what she did. Notice what she said, uh, what he said concerning her. It says, she hath done a, uh, she hath wrought, she hath done a good work on me. The idea of good is excellent. I wonder whose approval we are seeking to live for. Here was this woman, and she was seeking to live for the approval of her Savior and of her Lord. And here the Lord gives that commendation. She hath done an excellent work on me. How good it would be if our service was such that the Lord could look down and say, they have done an excellent service on me. But notice that he commended her for what she had done. Uh, Mark is the only one uh, that records this little phrase in verse number eight. She hath done what she could. You know, there was going to be a limit to what she could do. In order, to, um, in order to support and help uh, around the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. But what she could do, she did. She prepared his body before for the burying. Now, wouldn't it be good if the master could say about us, they have done what they could. May we be uh, always open uh, to the opportunities that he presents to us. And then the Lord Jesus uh, says to uh, these people who were murmuring uh, and uh, complaining about her, he says, listen, what this lady has done is going to be said, talked about down through the generations. And that's what, exactly what we're doing now. Isn't it? isn't it remarkable that this incident that men looked down upon has been recorded in Scripture for every generation since to be able to think about and to seek to emulate. I wonder what impact what we are doing will have upon succeeding generations. May it be that succeeding generations see our devotion to our master too. That the example that we are leaving, because we're leaving an example of some description or another, may it be an example of devotion, of understanding, of worship, and of faithfulness. But then we move on to the heart of Judas Iscariot. And we come from this glorious uh, uh, interlude back to the darkness of the heart of Judas. 
verses 10 and 11, and we see that it's a heart of betrayal. He went to the chief priest to betray him. We see that it's a heart of greed. They promised to give him money. Mind you, it wasn't much money. The price of a slave, no, even less than that, the price of a slave that had been gored by the horde of an ox. And you come from the appreciation of a Mary to the grief and the betrayal of the heart of a Jesus. And how sad it is to see that a man who had spent three years in the presence of the Lord Jesus was one who was so overtaken by grief that he would even betray the Lord Jesus to his enemies. How sad the response of the religious leaders prepared to pay so that their murderous intent might be satisfied. And it reveals their hearts to be hypocritical. Outwardly, uh, so upright and so righteous, so much so that in a couple of days' time, they wouldn't even go into Pilate's palace because they say it's the feast day tomorrow and we can't defile ourselves by coming into it. But the Lord Jesus had already said that it's what comes out of the heart that defiles a man. And here they're revealing their hearts to be hypocritical, to be murderous towards the Lord Jesus. The Lord's condemnation was this, that they were whited sepulchres, full of death on the inside, but like to dress it up as pure and white on the outside. May it be that we're never found as such as these religious leaders who were so hypocritical in their behavior. Verses 17 through to 21 carries on the subject really of uh, Judas's heart. Because in verses 17 to 21, uh, the disciples and the Lord Jesus are at supper. Uh, and it says when they were at supper, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And these verses show us that the Lord was very aware of what was going on. I wonder, do we forget that sometimes? That the Lord is very aware of what is going on in our hearts. The Lord is going to be the one who righteously judges all in the judgment seat of Christ, not just our actions, but our motives as well. The Lord Jesus understands the heart of all. And so he reveals the intent of betrayal in the heart of one of his own. But do you notice the lovely, the lovely graciousness of the Lord Jesus right to the end? He doesn't name who it is. But in raising it, he is giving a warning to the one who is intending to betray him. And in giving him a warning, he gives a final chance to repent. You know, the Lord Jesus is so long-suffering. The Lord Jesus is so gracious. And if the Lord Jesus uh, can treat the one who was to the one who was to betray him in such a gracious and such a long-suffering way, we can rejoice in the fact that the Lord Jesus is the one who would deal patiently with us as well. Verse 21 brings before us a classic example of the, uh, the, the combination of divine sovereignty and of human free will. The Lord Jesus gives a final warning to Judas Iscariot. And he says, the son of man indeed goes as it is written of him. The fact that Christ was going to go to the cross was fixed. It was in the prophetic calendar. It was in God's plan for mankind. That was fixed. That was God's sovereign will. But that never, ever excused Judas from what he did. Notice it goes on to say, but woe, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good word for that man if he had never been born. Human beings can never point to God and say, God, it is your fault for the decisions that we have made. May it be that we're ever conscious of what is right and what is wrong, 
and may it be that we choose what is right. And as God gives us opportunity after opportunity to repent at times, may we not harden our hearts as Judas did as he heard this warning from the Lord Jesus. But let's go back to another positive uh, one. It's, it's nice to see how the Spirit of God interweaves the positive and the negative through this chapter. And it's just showing to us how the hearts of different people responded to the Lord Jesus. Let's go back to verse number 12. And here in verses 12 through to 16 of Mark chapter 14, we have the heart of the unnamed house owner revealed. The heart of the unnamed house owner. I think it was last year, Andrew went through various unnamed people uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, their service for the Lord Jesus or the service that they were involved in. Here is a lovely unnamed character of the Bible. You know, you can learn so much from those that are unnamed. Those that are not known and recognized by men, but God knows every single one of them. Isn't it good to know that we might not hit the headlines and we might not even want to hit the headlines. Uh, we might not be well known by mankind, uh, but what we do is recorded in heaven. Notice, first of all, the desire of the disciples. In verse number 12, it says, Where will you that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? You know, it was good that they had a desire to eat the Passover because that's what the Bible said that they should do. But what I love, too, is their desire to refer their plans to the Lord. You know, that's a good uh, example, isn't it? Uh, that's a really good thing to do, is that we might have desires in our heart. We might have things that we want to do and things that we think are right to do. But isn't it good just to bring all of our plans before God and seek his will and to seek his counsel and to seek his approval? They knew what was the right thing to do, but they needed guidance just how to carry it out. And sometimes we might know the right thing to do, but not just quite how to do it. And so they come to Christ and he gives them the instructions as to what to, what to do. So we see the desire, desire of the disciples, then the directions of the Lord. You see, when the disciples asked, they suddenly found that the Lord had a plan. And isn't that wonderful how that uh, the, the, the desire of the disciples and the will and the planning of Christ came together at this point? And isn't that encouraging that it may just be a case that God has laid upon our hearts a desire to do something. And when we come to him just to know the wisdom as to how to do it, we suddenly find that God has a plan all laid out and ready to go. And so the plan involved a water-bearing man. A man was going to be carrying a pitcher of water through uh, the town. And so he would have been uh, ident easily identifiable. So a water-bearing man and then a welcoming owner. In the response to the request of the disciples uh, that the master asks, where is the guest chamber? They're going to find something. They're going to find three things. Number one, a large room. Number two, a furnished room. Number three, a prepared room. A large room, a furnished room, a prepared room. All three of which demonstrate that here was a heart that was willing to share generously. You know, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, doesn't he? 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us that. And here in this unnamed house owner, he finds one who gave cheerfully. He, he didn't just stick Jesus and the disciples into a small room at the back of the house, but he gave him a large upper room. It was not only large, but it was furnished and prepared for all that they needed as well. And so we've seen uh, the desire uh, of the disciples and the direction of the Lord Jesus. But then notice finally the diligence of the disciples as well. What does it say in verse uh, number 15, uh, verse number 16, sorry. And his disciples went forth, came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. It's a simple lesson, isn't it? But it stands repeating that when the Lord gives instruction, 
it is good for us to follow through exactly what the Lord Jesus tells us to do. And so we see the lovely heart of this homeowner. It was open and welcoming, and it was generous to the Lord. I wonder just how generous I am with the things that God has given to me. How generous am I at giving them back to the Lord and to his people for their use? And when we come down to verses 22 to 25, uh, we see the heart of the Lord's Supper. We see the centre of it, the focus of it. It is very briefly mentioned here. Uh, it's uh, expanded in more detail, slightly more detail in Matthew and in Luke. And then Paul deals with it more fully in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. But very, very briefly, we have the very heart, the very focus, the very core of the breaking of bread. Number one, the symbolism. The Lord takes the bread and he takes the cup, which was to be filled with the fruit of the vine. And he explains uh, briefly the significance. He says the bread, it is his body. And notice that this incident uh, takes away any idea that the bread literally turns into the body of the Lord, or the blood literally turns into, uh, the, 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 the cup literally turns into the blood of the Lord. For there was the Lord standing nearby. It is a symbol. The bread and the cup stand representative of the body and the blood of Christ. And just as in the Old Testament, the body of the sacrificial animal was given for the offering, and part of it was to be eaten to show the identification, their association with the sacrifice. So here in symbol, the disciples were to associate themselves with that which had been given for them. And so as we take the bread uh, at the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day morning, week by week, so we are identifying ourselves in symbol with the one who was sacrificed on our behalf. And we are showing that we have become partakers in that sacrifice. Likewise, the cup, his blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Here the focus is upon those who have come into the good of the shed blood. Notice that it says the blood that is shed for many. The idea of the word for is on behalf of many. And so we can say that the blood of Christ was shed for all. There's the potential for all to come and have their sins forgiven and to be washed clean through the blood of Christ. But it was only shed on behalf of. It is only effective to those that receive the Lord Jesus by faith. And so it says here that this is the cup of uh, the, the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Thus, just as the blood of the sacrifice was only good for the offerer that brought it, so the shed blood of Christ is only effective for those who believe. You know, this is why the Lord's Supper is, or should be, only open for those who are true believers. Because in take, eating of the bread and in drinking of the cup, there is that outward demonstration that we are linked with and we have come into the good of, and we are partakers of the sacrifice of Christ. And for the unbeliever, they have no part in that at all. The Lord's Supper should only be open for those who are believers, number one, and then elsewhere. Uh, it brings in the fact that the believer should be baptised before partaking as well. We see the fact that he notice, notes that it is the blood of the New Testament, the blood of the New Covenant. The Old Covenant 
uh, the Old Testament was brought into effect by the shedding of the blood of sacrifices. And so the New Testament would be ratified, would be made good, would be guaranteed on the basis of the blood of Christ. You see, it's an essential part of the New Testament that their sins and iniquities I will remember no more, God says. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The shedding of the blood of Christ was essential for the bringing in of the new covenant. And so we have the heart of the Lord's Supper. But I would just like to challenge ourselves that the Lord's Supper and our response to it is perhaps a revealing of our hearts as well. The Lord Jesus instituted two physical rites that we should do. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. It was a personal request of the Lord Jesus that, that is recorded in Luke's gospel that you do this in memory of me. And so as we come and as we think about the breaking of bread, as we think about the Lord's Supper, it is a challenge to our hearts as to how much of a priority it is, not just in our presence, but also in our preparation. And we've seen how that Mary spent 300 pence a year's wages on that which she would bring to Christ to show her appreciation. I wonder. What effort has gone into what we bring, what I bring, on a Lord's Day morning? As we know, the breaking of bread would take place week by week. Is there that sense of preparation and effort that we might bring to God a suitable remembrance of our Saviour? Breaking of bread is a challenge to our hearts as to what response we're going to give in preparation, in presence, whether we're here. And in participation, that when we're here, are we participating? You know, you can be in a place, but you can be completely far away from the place, can't you? Uh, there's, there's times where um, my wife has asked me in the past just to ask the children to quiet down in the car. And I would turn around and say, I didn't even notice they were making a noise because I was completely elsewhere. You know, the challenge of the breaking of bread is this. If the Lord has asked us to come, and remember him. Am I participating, either audibly or inaudibly, in active remembrance of him during the time? The heart of the breaking of bread is the body, is the bread and the cup, and it reveals our hearts in our response to that as well. Verses 26 to 31, very quickly, we see the heart of the disciples, the heart of the disciples. As they're going from the, uh, the upper room, uh, they're going out to the uh, Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Lord Jesus reveals to them, all of you will be offended because of me this night. And so the Lord Jesus reveals uh, their offense. They're going to be ashamed of their association with the Lord. He reveals to them their scattering that with the Lord smitten, then his sheep would scatter for fear. You know, fear in the heart can make us respond in two ways. It will either make us ashamed of Christ, or it will drive us to Christ. And depending, I would suggest, and on the basis of this, depending on the view that we have of our own strength, would depend on the outcome of fear. If we recognize that we are weak, then our fear will drive us to Christ, desiring his strength. If we are confident in our own ability to stand for Christ, then when the temptation and the trial comes, then the chances are that we will end up being ashamed of Christ because we try and stand in our own strength. So their offense, they would be ashamed of him. Their scattering, they would scatter for fear. 
their hope. Notice what the Lord Jesus says. Verse 28, but after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. You know, they were going to let the Lord Jesus down big time. I'm sure we can all think back to times when we've done that. I can remember probably the thing that sticks most out in my mind, which really gave me a stir, just to make sure I was preparing to be ready to give an answer, was I was once asked uh, when I was about 16 or so, 15 or 16, what does it mean to be a Christian? And I hesitated too long. And the person then said, does it mean this? And I agreed because that was part of it, but it wasn't the central part of it. And the opportunity was gone. We moved on to the next bit of the work that we're doing. And I missed the opportunity. And from that time, there's always been that consciousness in my heart that we need to be ready. We won't have an answer to every single question, but let's take the opportunities to try and make sure that we are in a position to give an answer of some sort. Not just the hope that he gives them. They're going to mess up. But he says, when I've risen, I'm going to go before you in Galilee. They may have thought when Christ died, it was the end and they had let him down. But if only they had remembered this, they could have had hope that the Lord Jesus, even amidst their failure, had not given them up. Because he says, I'm going to go before you into Galilee when I am risen. Notice Peter's confidence. Peter was full of confidence that if anyone else, if everyone else let him down, uh, let the Lord down, then he certainly wouldn't. Notice the strength of what he says. He says this, uh, even if others let you down, I won't be. When the Lord says that he was going to deny him, he says no, even more vehemently. There's a violence in the expression. And then he goes even as far to say, look, I'm prepared to give my life for you. Peter was so confident, but his confidence was in self. His confidence was in self. You know, many of us perhaps have high ideals about what we would like to do. What we would like to do in certain situations. And maybe like Peter, We've said in our own heart that we will never let the Lord down. But then the temptation comes, the trial comes, and we fall. The scriptures say this, let him that think of me stand. Take heed, lest he fall. We're not going to get into the next section. I think we'll do that next week and, and finish it off. But that's where we finished last week, wasn't it? We finished last week, watch. Be vigilant, be on your guard. And now here is Peter, and he's saying, I'm never going to let you down, Lord. And the Lord's going to ask him in the garden to watch. And because he doesn't watch, he lets the Lord down. The theme is running through strongly, isn't it? In the light of the coming of the Lord Jesus, in the light of all that the Lord Jesus has suffered on our behalf, in the lights of all that he is. Are we prepared to watch? And are we prepared to worship? And are we prepared to rest on him for the strength that we need to face the trials of God? We finish this section and continue on the chapter uh, next week uh, in uh, the will of our God. But in the meantime, let's just ask God for his help uh, to help us to watch, to be alert, and to serve, and to worship. Shall we pray? Oh God, we're so thankful that thou art a gracious and a kind and a, a long-suffering God. Our Father, we pray that you'd help us to ever come to thee for the strength, the dependence that we need. Father, we pray that we would not think that we can stand in our own strength, but that our Father would be found at the feet of the Lord Jesus, that like Mary of old, our hearts might grow closer in devotion and deeper in understanding. Our Father, we're so thankful for that Christ was willing to go through for us and pray that this might come afresh every day. And our Father, we pray that our hearts might be stirred uh, just as we come week by week to the Lord's Supper, just to bring our appreciation 
to thee of him for all that he has done. Go with us now, we pray. Give us help in the coming week, we ask. In the Saviour's precious name. Amen.